talking today on Daily Debrief about the most short-lived coup not to be that memory can recall. The Wagner Group chief has retreated to Belarus after Saturday's shenanigans in southern Russia. Another shocking reminder of the work not done to help victims of the Bhopal gas leak in India. A study reveals the biggest industrial tragedy leaked toxic gases and chemicals in 1984 that are reaching beyond generations to cause health havoc. And the election in Greece returns conservative new democracy to power, while prominent left party Syriza slides amid rising anti-immigration rhetoric. The Wagner Group retreated very quickly from its weekend march towards Moscow. Belarus reportedly intervened and prevailed upon its chief Yevgeny Prigozhin. Prigozhin's next steps in Belarus or anywhere else are unclear, but evidently some changes are afoot in Wagner's Russia operations. On Saturday, we asked Prabir Purkasa, editor-in-chief of NewsClick, about what the Western media was then calling a coup. It is still calling the incident a big crack in Vladimir Putin's authority over Russia. So let's return to Prabir for more details on what we actually know so far. Prabir, we spoke on Saturday about the Wagner Group, the, uh, the coup that was not to be. And it was the shortest-lived rebellion ever. Within hours, I think, of our speaking, they called it off. Uh, how do we explain this? Well, you know, this is going to be, again, uh, something on which we are going to discuss for a long time. Uh, because if you listen to various media reporting on it, this is the end of Putin, according to the Western media. There are cracks in Russia. It's a huge issue. On the other hand, as you said, it is the shortest coup, coup ever. And it didn't seem to have uh, led to any fights that we could see with the Russian military. Even in Rostov on Don, when we saw the visuals over there, the people seemed to be going around the tanks without bothering. So it was a very strange coup in that sense, that it seems not to have created any confrontation. And I think that's very important, that uh, the Russian military did not stop uh, Prigozhin's Wagner group rolling towards Moscow. It, in fact, it passed to Warrens. It was on the way to Moscow. And you can see the route. Therefore, it seems that backdoor uh, backroom negotiations were in progress. And finally, what Prigozhin got from this is only that he goes to Belarus. Now, yes. what he will do in Belarus, at least he's not been arrested. He's not going to be put on trial. So that part of it, he see, that seems to have been an escape route for him. And then what he will do in Belarus, we don't know. It's also the president of Belarus has a friendly relations with him. And that's why he perhaps was brought into this. The, so at the moment, we it, for us, it's very, uh, shall we say, puzzling. What's really happened? Was it, again, something that Prigozhin was doing in order to negotiate? Is the office rocker, as people say? Is that what happened? Is it a brinkmanship in which finally realized that he was not going to get anywhere? And therefore, he finally agreed to essentially surrender to the terms that uh, Putin or the Russian state was willing to discuss with him. So all of this is open to question. Net result is in Russia, nothing has really happened. It doesn't look like the Russian state has been disturbed. It doesn't look like Putin's uh, government, as people keep on referring to, the Russian government is in a, any crisis. It doesn't appear to be. It does seem that uh, Prigozhin was trying to negotiate something. We don't know what at the moment. But it's also true that Prigozhin and his Wagner group were being asked to become a part of the Russian army, particularly in uh, fighting within Russia against okay. Ukraine forces, and therefore to be under Russian command, not to have two separate commands in this particular case. And that the rest of the Wagner group in Russia seems to have accepted. The real question for Wagner will be, and for Russia will be, that they were playing a role in Africa. That That's right. Was, you know, they were, in fact, supplanting the French soldiers in a lot of these countries 
which thought that the French were involved also in coups, that they, while they came for as peacekeepers, they were meddling. France was meddling in these countries and therefore replacing the existing government quite often and uh, replacing it with something else. And they thought that Wagner was a much more neutral force, providing only security to the government. So this, this role that Wagner had in Africa, what will, to the what will happen to that is still an open question. And they are there in a number of countries, including starting from Syria down to you know, Mali, in terms of other countries. So I think that would be a big question. Because, because it was a power projection that Russia had in Africa, which after this may be more difficult. People may not trust uh, Wagner enough, given the fragility at the top. So I think these are questions that Russia and uh, Prigozhin and Wagner will have to face in the coming days. And we'll see, have to see, we'll, have, we'll see how that shapes up. Right, Prabhi, did I hear you right on the fact there's some sort of a nationalization of Wagner Group, they're absorbing it within the military in Russia and they have agreed to that? Within the army structure, Wagner will be accommodated, will be under the command of Russian army. That seems to be one of the conditions they were given about a couple of months back. And that was one of the points of discord between Wagner, Prigozhin, Prigozhin, and Russia, the Russian armed forces. They didn't want to have somebody who has arms, who has soldiers, to be a loose cannon, to put it mildly, within Russia. So therefore, the argument was that your forces will have to be under our command, because ultimately, when an army fights, there cannot be two commands. Right. So that, that was the argument. And Prigozhin was very unhappy about it because he, his whole thing is based on he. Of course, he's not a military commander. So that's uh, he's basically the owner of the Wagner group. He's not the one who fights, though he does wear the dress. He does go to his soldiers. He does egg them on and so on. But he doesn't really, he's not their commander because he's never been in the army that, uh, as, a, as in any serious uh, position. So he was, in fact, he came laterally into Wagner as a, not as a professional part, but as essentially a businessman. So that was the business he was in. So given all of that, uh, that was one of the points of contention. Now I think that's over, that it's not possible for Wagner to operate independently within Russia. And in the fight against Ukraine, of course, there has to be a unified command of which the Wagner group will be a part. It's also interesting, again, from reports we are seeing that none of the senior commanders of Wagner actually sided with Prigozhin. So That's that right. was also the other part of it. But as I said, you know, how much of it was brinkmanship, how much of it was, uh, a pro, you know, a real serious rift, was it something a show for the people. These are all questions we'll be discussing for some time to come. But there's no question. It has cracked the Russian image. It has damaged it to some extent. And also it will have repercussions if the Wagner group gets disorganized and is no longer the force it was. It will have repercussions in Africa for Russia because Wagner was at least a force projection for Russia in terms of providing an alternative to the French, Americans, and others of giving security, providing secure security to various governments in that region, in particularly Central and uh, Central West Africa. So I think those are the areas where we will have to see what the impact is. Right, Prabhi. Thank you very much for joining us. In your study of the health effects of the Bhopal gas tragedy in India brings startling reminders of the neglect of millions of victims. New towns and settlements have come up in and around Bhopal where the gas leak occurred since the December 1984 toxic gas leak. Poisonous chemicals continue to leak into the soil from the Union Carbide plant in the city. We asked Jyotsna Singh of the People's Health Movement to explain the study's most prominent findings. 
Jyotsna, thanks for joining us. So, an important publication looking at the health impact of the Bhopal gas tragedy and also the region around where the gas leak happened. Can you walk us through some of the highlights of this report? Absolutely. So, uh, the study has been published in British Medical Journal, their open uh, source uh, publication. And the study has been done by a group of US-based scientists uh, from University of California, Santiago. And it has some stark findings. Uh, so, the researchers have compared the data uh, from early 90s to 2015-16, uh, uh, okay. um, NFHS data uh, uh, round 4. Uh, and what they found was that uh, among men who were uh, in the uterus of women when the tragedy happened in the December of uh, 84, uh, what kind of uh, health problems or what is the difference in their health outcomes compared to the general population? Uh, and what they found was that the rate of cancer is so high among them. So in general, the rate of cancer is eight times more uh, than the general men, uh, which is uh, quite devastating. But there, uh, there is worse, which is um, those men who did not shift out of uh, that the area uh, after the tragedy, among them, cancer is as prevalent as much as 27 times higher than the general population. So this is really disastrous. Uh, that is, uh, then the other findings uh, are also there, which is that the disability among these men is much higher, which actually shows 15 years later in their lives. And which means um, the way it, uh, their other social, uh, it impacts their other social indicators also. So uh, they attain less education compared to uh, other people because uh, disabled population is more marginalized in our country and otherwise also. So they have two years of less education which impacts their employment. Of course. Also their disabilities are such that they are not able to sustain their employment for long. Um, so, so this is, uh, these are the things and the uh, area of study is not small. The area of study is 100 kilometers radius, 100 kilometers around the site of the disaster, the site of the factory. A full 100 kilometers around is where this impact has been seen. Yes, which is a huge area. Uh, so generally it is believed that, uh, you know, uh, we will look at 4.5 kilometers up to 7 kilometers and let's see what happened. Um, and that is where uh, the, the, maybe the, dis, uh, the radiation and everything stopped, but that did not happen. And it is also because uh, the gas, which is, uh, uh, methyl uh, isocyanide, yes. uh, MCI, uh, it is uh, uh, quite a toxic uh, gas uh, that comes out. Uh, it impacted not only the people directly exposed, but because later it went into the groundwater uh, and that kept uh, impacting lives yes. and it had longer term impacts than just one night. Uh, so so we, what the study shows that this is an intergenerational problem. It is not only about people directly being exposed to the gas. And we hope that it can be looked, uh, the entire um, uh, health problem and the compensation and how to deal with uh, the disaster can be looked at in a much more comprehensive way by the government and by Union Carbide itself and uh, the, the owners who are uh, who have really gotten scot free <laughs> despite uh, killing so many people. Uh, but it has to be looked into in our study shows in a far more comprehensive way than how they have looked at it so far. Just now there have been other studies over the years into this tragedy, which is now almost 40 years uh, since the gas leak. Does this add to that existing literature and are there any recommendations for, you know, this kind of relief and restitution for the people? Also, why, why only men? Is there a scientific reason why only men were picked for the study? Uh, so the thing is, there have been a lot of other studies already and we have literature looking at uh, different uh, sectors of people. For example, it has been well known and there are studies to show how women got really badly impacted. Uh, so, um, uh, 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 this uh, studies show that women who were exposed not just directly but their female offsprings also, uh, they face menstrual irregularities that is their periods um, are problematic which actually means their entire reproductive system uh, goes, yes. for a, uh, goes for a toss and then they face those problems. They give more stillbirths which is again uh, which takes a toll on a woman's body um, and the infant mortality is far more um, among uh, these uh, uh, kids uh, who were born uh, who were born of 
uh, women uh, in and around gas. exposed to the gas. Um, so, so, so there are a lot of uh, these problems that women face. They face premature menopause, and again, not just the uh, women exposed directly, but also their female children. And premature menopause again has its own complications in your life. So, the quality of life of people overall, be it men or women, it has been impacted intergenerational uh, across the entire throughout their lifespan. They have faced something or the other. So, so this is a serious matter. Of course. Uh, let's talk about the solutions that you were just talking about. What should be done? So, well, one is justice, I think, is something that one needs to ask for. That why uh, have people gotten scot free completely, even though we know about uh, half a million deaths and uh, 30,000 deaths and uh, half a million people being impacted, right? So, we have uh, seen that. Uh, there has been no justice. People are still fighting for uh, justice and compensation that has not been given uh, appropriately, adequately. Uh, there are organizers, the children who were uh, people who were children that time, they are fighting for their rights. So, what and what kind of a support you are providing uh, to, for example, the disabled people who got disability because of that, who lost uh, their livelihood and who lost their near and dear ones. Uh, so, what kind of an rehabilitation can you give compensation of course is something that keeps coming up and now that we know that it is it goes much beyond the radius that the government right has looked at till now uh, so the compensation has to be of that order and it has to be dealt with sensitively at this point um, you have a special hospital um, in bhopal for the gas tragedy That's victims right. you go there anytime and the scene is so bad actually the people go to other government hospitals to get treatment it is not being taken care of so you create something but which exists actually only on the papers but it's a building with very less infrastructure and uh, the real solutions that people need um, so cancers have to be looked into there are so many studies which show that uh, there are there is more cancer in these areas than uh, ever before uh, than any other area so that yes. there has to be a special uh, 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 solution for people uh, like this. And again, I would say that the industrialists who did this should be made accountable and that should be uh, brought to justice. Red Jyotsna, thanks very much for joining us and highlighting this important issue. Voters handed a fresh four-year term to the new democracy party in Sunday's election in Greece. Syriza lost more than 30 MPs as fringe parties, including so-called Spartans with strong anti-immigration positions, entered parliament. Greece held an inconclusive election in May. Abdul from People's Dispatch joins us in the studio with more details. Abdul, good to have you on the show. So, Abdul, what does the result exactly say in the Greek election? Uh, I think it is by and large a repeat of what was the result in May. If you see, except for the fact that Syriza, the main opposition party, the left party, which was in the power before uh, New Democracy came into power in 2019, has lost more seats. Yes. Apart from that, r rest of the uh, result, if you see, after counting of around 95-96% of the votes, uh, report says that uh, New Democracy has around 40 point some percentage of votes and the seats that is the one major difference between May and this. Last time there were five seats short to majority. This time they have comfortable majority of 158 seats. But that can also be uh, linked with the changed electoral system. In May there was a proportional representation system. Okay. Uh, now they have a new system according to which whichever is the leading party gets bonus seats around 30 to 50 bonus seats. So that basically adds up into the uh, new democracy's overall gains. Uh, apart from this, of course, the left parties in general, there are many left parties because of the Syriza's division within the Syriza. Yes. And then there is, of course, the uh, KKE, the Communist Party in Greece, and there are other left parties. They have by and large maintained their seats, which was there in the May. And it seems that if you, apart from Syriza, rest of them have performed by and large, rest of the left parties have performed as per their, uh, their performance in the last election in May. So uh, that is one uh, important fact thing to note. Uh, 
apart from that, there is a strong emergence of the ultra right wing. The, they had uh, banned uh, one of the right wing parties claiming that it is anti-immigration, immigrant, it is basically propagating fascist uh, Nazi ideas and so on and so forth. But despite the fact that the leader of that party was in jail, mm -hmm. he had supported Spartans and party which right. was nowhere before the election has made a strong presence with 13 seats and around 5% of the votes so far. That is one major concern and that is the, by and large uh, about the seat arrangements and the percentage of vote uh, okay. in, the, in this election. Abdul, uh, let's talk about what explains the results, the rise of the far right in particular. What explains this? Well, uh, uh, there are two, two, three main things. Of course, there is a traditional uh, right wing presence in most of the European countries, but those there is a strong sentiment, particularly during in Greece in particular, when the uh, uh, economic collapse happened uh, around right. a decade ago. The, the, a section of the, of course, people mobilized, were mobilized behind the left, see, left party series and all. But there is a section which basically blamed uh, uh, for the economic coll collapse, the European Union, and the kind of policy prescription it was, imp it was imposing on the Greek uh, economy. And that basically, basically anti-EU sentiments were basically uh, behind the rise of the right-wing parties in uh, uh, Greece in, in particular. Apart from that, the immigrants, the, uh, as Greece being one of the uh, major countries of the des which is the destination of large number of refugees and migrants from Africa and uh, uh, other Asian countries crossing the Mediterranean, that basically creates, a f particularly due to the economic crisis when the uh, the, the people in Greece lost uh, jobs. And, and they had uh, heavy austerity measures. Austerity measures and everything. In that context, they had, uh, it was easy to mobilize people behind the ultra right wing ideas of immigrants being responsible for your economic uh, problems. So these factors basically added into the rise of the right wing uh, in Greece in particular. So if even the if you see the popularity of the new democracy uh, has certain roots. Of course, it is not the extremist uh, kind of right wing, but it is economic right wing in some sense, uh, particularly in the context, if you see it, compare it with Syriza's thing, it is. Right. Uh, and in that, that basically primarily emerges from the economic concerns, which Syriza had failed to uh, uh, address during its first, uh, uh, during its uh, five, four years uh, prime ministership. Uh, Garner, uh, which he, it has between 2015 and 2019. And it seems there is a, a larger reception that the new democracy has basically quote unquote performed well, implemented the new liberal austerity measures. And despite doing that, it has been able to kind of stabilize the economy, stabilize and create more jobs and uh, kind of control the overall uh, situation. But nonetheless, there is an overall economic uh, problem fa faced by the uh, uh, working class in Greece. And given the fact that the left has not been able to put forward an, a strong alternative, a section of the working class has also moved towards right. So if it is a combination of factors which is responsible for the rise of the right wing in Greece and in the rest of the European countries. Right, Abdul. Thanks very much for joining us. And that's all we have for today. Thanks very much for watching Daily Debrief. We will see you again on Tuesday. Until then, you can find more of our work on our website, peoplesdispatch.org, our social media accounts on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and our YouTube channel have more updates and this show, Daily Debrief. Thanks again for watching.